Um, our first project flew in the negative vertical direction. Our second project flew in the positive vertical direction. So uh, precision automated lander, Paul, and uh, project manager, Christina Hopperson. System Validation Review of the Precision Automated Lander, also known as Paul. My name is Christina Halverson, and I'm the project manager for this project. Today for our system validation, we will be discussing the, um, excuse me, the team organization, then introducing you to Paul and its design history. We will also discuss the subsystem validation testing and outcomes, as well as the system validation testing and outcomes. And finally, we will conclude with configuration management and management of the project. Here's an overview of our team organization. The project was divided into four different subsystems, each led by a team lead as senior. Working with the, excuse me, working with the team leads are the team members, and the team leads report directly to the project manager. Communicating between the subsystems are the two integrators, who report to the assistant project manager, who also reports to the project manager. Uh, my assistant project manager for this team is Benjamin Anderson. So when we began the concept of Paul last semester, um, as you can see here in the Katia model and in the fully fabricated system to my right, uh, we set several objectives and goals that we wanted to meet. These are that it would be Earth-based, that it would be semi-autonomous, maintaining a stable flight, and maneuver to a target location and, uh, land in, er, and perform a landing sequence. Upon performing the landing sequence, it would then deliver a payload while maintaining safety to the system and the payload throughout the entire mission operations timeline. <coughs> we then uh, designed and evaluated a mission operations timeline, and it consists of five phases. The first phase are pre-flight operations, which includes setting up the ground station and establishing telemetry with the system. We would then launch or ascend a minimum of three meters, travel a minimum distance of 20 meters, and land within 2.5 meters of a target location uh, while completing this in less than 120 seconds. Upon landing, we would perform post-flight operations, such as deploying a payload. We went through several iterations of the design of history of Paul. Our first iteration included uh, rockets, um, mainly cold gas thrusters, and bioprops were evaluated. Um, we also had a two-level system with the payload in between. Then, because of time and monetary constraints, we downsized our system and evaluated electric ductive bands, also known as EDFs. We then downsized the system from two platforms to one platform while keeping the payload on top of the platform. Having chosen EDFs, we then had three different options. We had four, six, or eight electric ductive band system. At this time, we also decided to move the payload from the top of the platform to the bottom of the platform for easier payload deployment. At the beginning of the semester, we had to reevaluate our propulsion options because of budget constraints and because of the availability of the electric ductive bands. So what we decided to do was reevaluate. In our final system, we decided to use propellers. So we have six propellers around an hexagonal platform with the payload underneath. So outlining these subsystems in Paul, we have the structure subsystem, who is responsible for the structure mounts and legs that make up the four landing gear assemblies, as you can see on Paul. We also have the attitude determination and control, or ADC subsystem, uh, and their components, which include the GPS and compass. The propulsion subsystem, who is responsible for the six propellers and motors, and finally, the Software Power Onboard Computer and Communication, or SPOC subsystem, who is responsible for all of the onboard electronics, as well as monitoring the six propulsion batteries. As I, as I had previously stated, the project was divided into four different subsystems, each having a team lead. For the ADC team lead, we have Megan Calloway. The propulsion team lead, Zachary Henney. The structure team lead, Alexander Noyes. And finally, the Spock team lead, Melissa Blue. And with that, I will pass it off to Megan Calloway to discuss the ABC subsystem. Thank you, Christina. 
As she said, my name is Megan Calloway. I am the team lead for the Attitude Determination and Control Subsystem. Presenting with me today is my team member, Kevin Vicencio. He will be discussing the outcomes of our subsystem test later on. Here you can see our subsystem components. In the middle, you can see the RG Pilot Mega or APM 2.6, which was an autopilot. Our GPS over here, our power, or I'm sorry, our power module, and then our ADC antenna, which was sending telemetry data to the ground station. Our two requirements shown here are the determination requirements, and they are as follows. The attitude determination and control subsystem shall determine the position of Paul with an accuracy of 2.5 meters, and determine the orientation of Paul with a deflection angle accuracy of 10.4 degrees. It will be noted later that the control requirements will be shown later on in this presentation. Here you can see our performance metrics seen here for our two requirements that we needed to experiment, experimentally and numerically validate. And we numerically validated with our trajectory simulations and our method of experimental validation are our subsystem tests. Our two subsystem tests are our position measurement validation, which we compared the APM measurements to actual measurements, and our attitude measurement validation, where we compared the APM orientation measurements to the actual orientation. I would now like to hand it off to Kevin Vicencio, who will talk about these outcomes. Thank you, Megan. As you said, my name is Kevin Vicencio, and I'll be discussing the results for the ADC subsystem testing. For the position measurement validation, from our numerical simulations, it was determined that the allowable position error was 2.5 meters. As shown in the table to the right, the average experimental position error was 1.28 meters, which is less than our 2.5 meter tolerance. For the attitude measurement validation, from our numerical simulations, it was determined that the allowable orientation error was 10.4 degrees. As shown in the table to the right, the average experimental orientation error was 4.34 degrees, which is less than our 10.4 degree requirement. From these tests, it was confirmed that the previously mentioned subsystem requirements were validated. For future improvements, we would like to apply the actual system characteristics of Paul to the sixth order dynamic model. In addition, we would like to, use, we would like to record the APM 2.6 measurements using a data flash log. Furthermore, we would like to measure actual position between the launch and the APM further than five meters, and we would also like to use a three-axis rate table to more accurately reorient the APM. At this time, I would now like to pass the presentation to Zachary Henning to discuss the propulsion subsystem. Thank you, Kevin. As Kevin mentioned, my name is Zachary Henny. I am the team lead for the propulsion subsystem. Presenting alongside me today is my fellow team member, Matthew Brown. I'll be discussing the requirements and metrics and analysis methods we use to validate our requirements. Matthew will be discussing our experimental and numerical outcomes. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to the components of the propulsion subsystem, as seen on Paul to my right and the diagram on the screen. We have the uh, carbon fiber propeller, which was used to generate our lift. The propeller is a 15 inch uh, blade diameter with a pitch of 7.5 inches. The, that was then hooked up to the E-Flight Power 60 brushless outrunner motor and was controlled locally by the Phoenix Edge Electronic Speed Controller, or ESC. Our subsystem had two main requirements, the first being that we shall generate a minimum thrust of 147 newtons, and the second being that we shall use no more than 9 kilowatts of power. To validate these requirements, we derived two metrics, the first being our thrust metric, which as you can see here, was numerically validated by our motor and thrust analysis and experimentally validated by our thrust test. Our second metric, power, was validated by our power consumption analysis and also experimentally validated through our thrust test. Our motor thrust analysis equation is what you see on the screen here. It relates the thrust output by the motor to the local air density, uh, the diameter of the propeller blade, the speed at which it would be spinning, and the pitch angle. All this together gives you the thrust expected. Uh, to experimentally validate it, we derived our test based on uh, strain gauge setup, which I'll show on this slide. We had the motor mounted at the end of two parallel bars. We used two setups, the first using aluminum for the bars, the second using steel. Uh, we then related 
the stress to the strain, which was measured by four strain gauges, two located on the top and bottom of each bar. And we've recorded data at six different instances throughout the test. During each one of those instances, we would log 1,000 data points per second for a total of two seconds. As you see on here, we have our two different setups. On the left is the steel stand, which is far longer than the aluminum stand due to the greater modulus elasticity of the steel material used. And I would like to introduce Matthew Brown to discuss the propulsion outcomes. Thank you, Zachary. As he said, my name is Matthew Brown. I will be discussing the outcomes of the propulsion subsystem testing. After calibration, the motors were attached and run at six different thrust levels. Using the strain measurements from those, uh, correction, using the strain measurements, we were able to calculate the thrust and present this as a function of time. Now this is presented as a function of time because it shows that the sampling frequency of a thousand hertz, or yes, a thousand hertz over the two seconds does show the trends, the horizontal trends at each uh, sample, sample time. That data was then uh, filtered and averaged to produce a single thrust value as a function of the throttle input. The throttle input is a PWM signal, also known as a power modulated signal, uh, measured in uh, microseconds. This is the signal that would be that the electronic speed controllers would be receiving from the APM in order to determine the thrust, um, the throttle setting. This table represents all the maximum values of thrust received during the uh, during all of our testing. I'd like to identify this one value right here of 36.237 newtons of thrust on motor four of the, of the steel uh, test data. Now assuming all the motors are operating at that thrust level to provide a level flight, um, the total thrust output of the entire system is 217.2 newtons. Now as uh, we were running this thrust test, our electronic speed controllers were logging data, specifically current and voltage, as shown here as a function of our throttle input. The product of those of the current and voltage is our power, shown here. As the trends in as the trends from all of our data show the same thing, um, this is only the data from motor two of the steel thrust stand. This table represents all the maximum current and voltage experienced, as well as, well as the <coughs> calculated power. Summing the, these power together, uh, we receive a total power consumed of approximately seven kilowatts. In summary, the thrust and power requirements are both validated as our total thrust provided by the system is 217.2 newtons, and our power requirement is 7 kilowatts. For future improvements if this project is continued, these are going to occur in two categories, ex uh, analytically and experimentally. In the analytical procedure, we can improve our results by using a maximum power uh, correction, maximum battery voltage rather than the nominal voltage given by the battery as these batteries were using the full charge at the time of testing. We could also calculate a, a true thrust curve rather than assuming a linear thrust curve as the, as the, excuse me, as the equation that Zach specified earlier assumed a linear thrust curve. For the experimental procedure, we can improve by using exact beam bending equations for our test stands rather than assuming simplified beam bending theory. And finally, we can remove observed noise from the system due to the vibrations of the motors by incorporating a filter into the lab view code. 
I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Alexander Noyce to discuss the structure subsystem. Thank you, Matthew. As you mentioned, my name is Alexander Noyes, and I am the team lead of the structure subsystem. I will be going over the design and test plans of our subsystem, and presenting with me today is my team member, Stephen Hahn. You'll be going over the results of our tests later on. As you can see on our system here, the structure subsystem is made up of a Kevlar and Noen's honeycomb composite platform, which houses the propulsion batteries and electronics of Paul. The six propulsion booms, which the ESCs and propulsion motors are mounted to, and four landing gear, which use gas springs as a suspension system to support Paul during unexpected landing forces. The subsystem level requirement objective that our subsystem was in charge of validating are that the structure subsystem shall not shall be able to withstand a free fall from a height of one meter without damage that causes less than full functionality to the system, as well as withstand all forces that it may experience during the mission operations timeline. In order to validate these two requirements, we analyze the following performance metrics, which include internal stresses and the natural frequencies of the materials that we were using. In order to, numer to numerically validate these metrics, we performed an ANSYS simulation on the structure subsystem using various assumptions and design specifications. In order to experimentally validate these, we developed a series of three tests that I will be going into more detail with later. Here are some of the assumptions and specifications that went into our numerical analysis. More specifically, we derived the forces that the structure subsystem may experience using the free fall pipe of one meter, the component masses which total 15 kilograms based on our requirements, and a stroke length of our gas springs of approximately 6.4 centimeters. Also going into our simulation were the material properties of the various materials we were using, taken from various sources from the internet, with the exception of our Kevlar Nomex honeycomb yield strength, which was experimentally determined during the preliminary design phase using the three-point bed test. These are the four tests that our subsystem conducted in order to validate our requirements, the first of which being a three-point bed test on the carbon fiber tubing that we, will be, that we were using in our propulsion booms, in which we loaded a specimen of the carbon fiber tube on a test stand and applied bending forces to figure out the maximum force that it would experience uh, at breakage. We then performed a vibration test on the Kevlar and its honeycomb platform in which we clamped it to a shaker table in its upright position and vibrated it through the natural, through the operating frequencies of our propulsion motors to determine if there were any natural frequencies in that range. We did the same test for the carbon fiber tubes, except that we clamped it to the shaker table in its horizontal position and vibrated it through the same range. We then performed a structure subsystem impact test in which we hung the structure from a string approximately one meter in height above the ground and then cut the string to observe the impact for any damage that may cause less than full functionality. Uh, with that, I would like to pass the presentation to Stephen Hahn to discuss the outcomes of our tests. Thank you, Alexander. As you mentioned, my name is Stephen Hahn, and I'll be presenting the outcomes of the structure testing as well as the analytical procedures. Uh, first, we needed to uh, conduct an ANSYS simulation using the free fall forces of one meter. On the left here, you can see this simulation where the maximum stress in the carbon fiber tubes was approximately 225 megapascals. In order to uh, validate this experimentally, we conducted a three-point bend test mentioned by Alexander. The results of this bend test are seen here on the right, where a breakage occurred at approximately 2,020 newtons. This is far greater than the 246 newtons experienced in the simulation, therefore it is validated. We then did uh, vibration testing of both the Nomex platform as well as the uh, carbon fiber tubes. On the left, you can see the first three natural frequencies found using ANSYS modal analysis. And on the right, you can see the experimental results found from the shaker table. This graph on the right shows acceleration from the three accelerometers in Gs and uh, versus the frequency. It was run through the motor natural, or excuse me, the motor operating frequencies of 100 to 140 hertz. Since there are no peaks where all three accelerometers uh, peak, there is said to be no natural frequencies within this range between 90 and 170 hertz. Same procedure was done for the carbon fiber tubes. Uh, again, on the left are the ANSYS results, and on the right are the is, excuse me is the graph for the experimental procedure. Again, uh, Gs of acceleration and frequency. Each of these peaks shows the natural frequency with natural frequencies within the carbon fiber tubes. The first two natural frequencies were at 90 hertz and 510 hertz. Since these do not lie within the operating frequency of the motors, then we have validated this test. 
And finally is the structure impact test, where we drop the structure from a height of one meter. On the left is the same ANSYS simulation, where no stresses in the materials exceeded the material uh, strengths. And on the right is the structure after the drop. Upon further inspection, we found no damage to the structure validating this requirement. So we have experimentally and numerically validated our requirement and objective to uh, withstand all forces during operation. For future improvements, we would like to test more carbon fiber specimens for consistency as it is a composite. And we would like to increase the uh, drop height as well as add components for all the masses onto the drop test. And if we had a lot more time and money, we would like to create a second prototype for failure testing of electronic components primarily. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Mo Sablini, who's going to talk about the software power onboard computer and communication subsystem. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Mo Sablini, and I'll be taking you through the software power onboard computer and communication subsystem, otherwise known as SPOC. Presenting with me and also working with me today is team member Adrian Rector. Also working with me is team member Jennifer Transu. I will be taking you through the analytical and test procedures, and Adrian will be taking you through the results of that analysis and those down with that test. These tests, excuse me. The requirements that we needed to validate for the Spock subsystem were that Spock shall provide a minimum of 1.5 kilowatts of power to each motor of the propulsion subsystem, as well as provide a minimum of 30 watts to the electronics of Paul. Here's a block diagram of the Spock subsystem that I'll be walking you through. Uh, the key here represents uh, the power and signal, power shown in red, the signals are shown in green. Starting from the left, we have the electronics battery, which feeds into the power module. The power module then powers the uh, attitude termination control subsystem, the microcontroller onboard call, the relay, and the solenoid. The microcontroller here is an Arduino Mega, which controls and powers the seven temperature sensors, the temperature and humidity sensor inside the spot box two ultrasonic sensors, the buzzer, SD card shield, and XB. The XB uh, transceiver is connected to the Spock antenna. This antenna is connected wirelessly to the Spock antenna at the ground station, which is connected to another XB and then to, another, to the Spock laptop. Similarly, the ADC laptop is connected to a ground station antenna, which is linked wirelessly to the one over here. The ADC subsystem provides input to the EAC, which also draws power from each of the propulsion batteries the ESC then provides power and logic into each of the motors. So here are the performance metrics for each of the requirements. Uh, the, the metric we tested was the hour power output, excuse me. The method of numerical validation was uh, the uh, taking the nominal voltage and C rating of the battery. And for the experimental validation was performing a battery capability test. This, this is Spock's analysis method. Uh, these are the, the two important question, equations that we used. Uh, first is that power is equal to the maximum continuous current uh, provided by the battery times the voltage of the battery. Uh, the max continuous current is calculated by taking the capacity of the battery and multiplying, multiplying that by the C rate of the battery. These are test planes for each of these, uh, uh, to perform for each of these requirements. Uh, the purpose was, again, to validate the power output of each battery that it meets the requirement. And this was perform performed by measuring the voltage and current using the Agilent 344018A multimeter. This is the test method that we used to uh, analyze the results of the test. Uh, again, we use the equation power is equal to the current times the uh, voltage of the battery. Uh, the pass-fail pass criteria for each of the batteries was uh, for the propulsion battery, a minimum of 1.5 kilowatts of power. For the electronics battery, a minimum of 30 watts of power, and would fail if it did not meet that. I'm going to have to hand it off to Adrian Merchant to discuss the outcomes of these tests and analysis. Thank you, Mo. As you stated, my name is Adrian Rector, and I will be discussing the outcomes of Spock testing and analysis. Using the equations that Mo previously discussed, we found that we could expect a 2.3 kilowatt output from the propulsion batteries and 42.6 watts from the electronics battery. It should be noted that these, and that this analysis was completed using the nominal voltage, as well as the current range was derived from the C rating as well as the capacity. And as there was a range for the C ratings for the battery of the propulsion batteries, there was a range for the maximum current. Continuing into our experimental results, 
We were unable to measure the current due to a lack of equipment that could actually pull as well as measure the high amperage that we were expecting as the Agilent 34401A is limited to three amps. Therefore, as battery manufacturers are required to test the C rating before they ship, we use the minimum C rating analysis result of current shown here. The voltages, as you noticed from previously, are actually higher as this was done post-charging and therefore not at a nominal stance. The resulting powers are shown here with 43.5 watts for the electronics battery and 2.63 kilowatts for the propulsion batteries. Comparing the results of the experimental and the analysis, we find the 2% difference for the electronics battery as well as the 11% difference for the propulsion batteries. This is entirely contributed to the different states of the voltage measurements versus nominal and charge. Continuing then on to, oh, I apologize. Continuing into the conclusion of our results and our validation of our requirements, as we produced greater than 30 watts for our electronics battery and as we produced greater than 1.5 kilowatts for propulsion batteries, we consider both of our requirements validated. Should we continue into the next semester, we would recommend that we would buy a resistor network, which at the time we do not have the time allowance or the funds to do so, as this would allow us to produce a load on the batteries that would then draw the higher current values, as well as use different multimeters. We did find a multimeter on campus that can measure 10 amps, and as well as we found later that the ESCs could measure the higher current values. Finally, during the test, we designed a two-cell that we used the, excuse me, during all of these tests, the measurements were made for a two-cell battery. However, as we were doing subsequent tests following each other, we required longer periods of time than what would be just required for our flight. Therefore, if you notice, there's actually a different battery located on here and it's shown up on the screen. And this is a three-cell battery, which has a higher nominal voltage due to the larger amount of cells, as well as a higher capacitance, which then leads to a higher current value. I would now like to hand it off to Kyle Soloway to discuss integration. Thank you, Adrian. As she said, my name is Kyle Soloway and I will be discussing integration. Presenting with me today is Assistant Project Manager and Lead Integrator Benjamin Anderson, who will be discussing the configuration management documents, and also fellow integrator Aaron Taylor, who will be discussing the integration outcomes. Here we see the system level requirements which were uh, tested during the system weight test and the overall system flight test. These requirements state that Paul shall have a mass no more than 15 kilograms, including the payload, ascend to a height of at least three meters relative to the URAU recreational field one, travel a minimum of 20 meters to a target location, have a maximum flight time of 120 seconds, land within 2.5 meters of a target location, and be no more than 75 meters from the ground station during all phases of the mission operation. And here we see the ADC subsystem level requirements, which were tested during the overall system flight. Therefore, we will be discussing their validation in the integration sections. So here we see the system level metrics, which were uh, tested during both tests. Uh, here are the metrics. Over here are the corresponding requirements. And here we have our method of merit validation and our method of experimental validation. And same with as the previous table, here we see the ADC sub subsystem level uh, metrics. Oh, and as before, here we have the metrics that were measured, their uh, corresponding requirement, their method of numeric validation, and their method of experimental validation. So the system weight test was conducted in order to validate our 15 kilogram requirement. Uh, this test was conducted several days before our final flight test to ensure that all of the uh, required components were on board the system. Uh, for analytical purposes, we use the CATIA mass estimate tool to give a very rough estimate of all the components in our CATIA model. For the actual test, the, uh, the, you can see the setup over here in the AXPAD building. Uh, this test was conducted using a simple digital scale as well as it was elevated off the table with a small box. The system final flight test was our uh, last test of the semester. 
Uh, it was conducted on the ERAU Recreational Field Mon, which is one of the uh, lower soccer fields. Over here, we see a top-down view of the uh, a diagram of the field. Each of these uh, dots on here rec represents a flag, which you will be able to see in our system flight video. Uh, this field was set up this way in order to visually validate several of our system level requirements. This middle, these middle points here represent the flight path of Paul. Each of these points is a five meter increment totaling to 20 meters. At the end of this 20 meters, we have a 2.5 meter radius landing zone. And on either side, we have a five meter safety buffer zone. Uh, this was done to ensure that if uh, Paul was at no greater than 75 meters from the ground station at any point in time. Also, if Paul was to travel beyond this uh, buffer zone at any point, we would immediately initiate landing us uh, emergency landing procedures. Excuse me. Uh, also, down here at the other end, we have the starting position for the flight, and behind this, we have our ground station, which had the uh, Spock and ABC laptops and antennas, as well as several blast shields for uh, personal safety. <laughs> uh, for the purpose of maximum height, the APM 2.6 was programmed to 6 meters, which is greater than our 3 meter minimum requirement. Our flight was limited to a maximum of 120 seconds uh, requirement. To validate this requirement during our test, we used the stopwatches, which began timing as soon as our launch countdown reached zero and ended as soon as Paul touched the ground. And finally, for our uh, ADC subsystem metrics and requirements, these were uh, validated using the APM 2.6, which was recording data throughout the flight. This data will be discussed in the next section. And now I'd like to turn it over to Aaron Taylor to discuss the integration outcome. Thank you, Kyle. As you said, my name is Aaron Taylor, and I'll be discussing the integration testing outcomes. The first test I'd like to discuss is the system weight test. Initially, we got an uh, estimate using CATIA, which came out to be 18.29 kilograms. In order to attain a more accurate measurement, we use a digital scale to measure Paul a total of four times. In between each measurement, we, we re-teared the <clears throat> scale. Each time we measured it, it came out to 15.8 kilograms. As the second system requirement states that Paul shall have a mass no greater than 15 kilograms, this was not validated. For all of the system flight test requirements, we are using raw data from the APM in order to validate them. And as such, here is the orientation of the axis system of the APM with the roll axis coming out of the front of Paul. The system requirement three states that Paul shall ascend to an altitude of at least three meters, which can be shown here with this red line. As this graph shows that Paul ascended to a height greater than this, this requirement was validated. System requirement four, six, and seven state that Paul shall travel a distance of at least 20 meters, land within a 2.5 meter radius of a target location, and remain within 75 meters of the ground station. In this image, we can see Paul landed. Here is the center of the landing circle, denoted by this orange flag, with white flags showing the perimeter. As Paul landed past the orange flag and remained within the circle, this validates all three of those requirements. System requirement five states that Paul shall fly for no longer than 120 seconds. In order to validate this, we use a stopwatch at during the test, which came out to be approximately 64 seconds. By looking at the raw data from the APM, we can also be shown that it started and stopped giving commands within this time frame. ADC requirement three states that Paul shall not fly faster than 10 meters per second. As Paul flew no greater than 1.4 meters per second, this requirement was validated. ADC requirement four states that Paul shall be controlled with an acceleration of a magnitude no greater than 0.5 meters per second squared, which can be shown here with the red lines. Even though the Paul, uh, the APM experience acceleration is greater than this, we believe that can be explained by the fact that all six propellers were vibrating the accelerometer, causing it to experience acceleration is greater than it actually was. ADC requirement six states that Paul shall be controlled in the roll, pitch, and yaw axes with a magnitude of no greater than 10.4 degrees, which can be shown here. 
the yaw axis is the only axis that failed this requirement, which can be shown here as it moves up towards 20 degrees. Although we believe this can be explained by a gust of wind during the flight and is visible during our system flight video. AC requirement seven states that fall should be controlled with an angular velocity of no greater than 180 degrees per second. As Paul did not experience angular velocities greater than 0.4 degrees per second, this requirement was validated. As the APM has no way of giving us angular acceleration values, we use this equation to convert from angular velocity to angular acceleration. ADC requirement eight states that all should be controlled with an angular acceleration of magnitude no greater than 0.5 meters per second squared, shown here with this red line. As the APM experienced accelerations greater than this, this requirement was not validated. Here we can see the system level requirements that were and were not validated, as well as the ADC requirements that were and were not validated. Some improvements that could be made to the system if this project were to continue would be to remove some material from these landing gear brackets as they were over-engineered to ensure uh, <clears throat> structural integrity, as well as move the APM closer to the center of gravity of Paul to reduce any unwanted induced accelerations due to pitch moments, as well as running the raw data from the APM through filters to tr in an attempt to remove any engine noise, or motor noise, sorry and to reevaluate the system requirements by running a six motor trajectory analysis using the system characteristics of fall. I would now like to show you our system flight video. So what we've seen here is Paul initially lifts off, it is under human control. Once the pilot has Paul stable, he will switch it into auto mode where it would move back to its first waypoint and then begin its flight. And here it switches into auto mode. As you can see, there are orange flags surrounding the entire flight path as a safety buffer, as well as these white flags showing the path of flight. Here you can see the yaw I was discussing earlier. And here it is approaching the 2.5 meter radius landing flight. And here's a video of us deploying our payload. <laughs> <laughs> I would now like to pass it off to Benjamin Anderson to discuss configuration management. Thank you, Eric. As you said, my name is Benjamin Anderson. I'll be discussing configuration management. Along with integrating all subsystems together, my integrators and myself are also responsible for the configuration management, which is the documentation of putting all the subsystems together and cataloging instructions as well. To begin this, I'd first like to talk about how the uh, document numbers that we use. Each document number consists of nine different numbers, the first three being the family identifier numbers. The family identifier numbers uh, put together like components as well as documents. So below here are all of the individual family identifier numbers used in constructing Paul. The next four are the instance identifier numbers. When we have multiple components inside of one different or one single um, family identifier, we can use instance identifiers to differentiate between the individual documents. Shown here are all of our 200 level uh, subsystem bill of materials, subassembly bill of materials, excuse me, with their individual instance numbers. Finally, the last two numbers are the flavor identifier numbers. When we have a component that has different versions of it that are really similar, instead of creating an entirely new document, we can use a flavor identifier to differentiate, to differentiate between them. For instance, our half inch diameter carbon two has three different lengths of six inches, 775, and 9.5 inches using the 000102 family identifier numbers. This is our product structure tree. This is kind of a roadmap in constructing Paul. It has four different, different levels starting at the top with level one, level two, level three, and finally level four. We start from the ground up with level four, putting together each one of these individual sub-assemblies and building on top of that 
finishing with the Paul system assembly as seen here. Inside of each sub-assembly, there are two different numbers. The 200 level, which is the sub-assembly bill material, and the 300 level, which is the sub-assembly assembly document. As well with Paul, there are two numbers as well, with the system bill material and system assembly document. This is the product structure tree in document form. This document um, you know, shows the entire product structure tree as well as a title block. In the title block, there's a few things I'd like to point out. First of all, the part name. This is a short description of what the document is or what the component does. There is the document number, which is also mirrored on the top of the document, as well as a page number, total page number, if there are more than one pages inside the document. There's also a signature block, or the original drafter, the manager, and then finally our boss or, or Dr. Benavides uh, would we finally release the document. If we were to, oh, excuse me, all of these numbers are hyperlinked inside of the uh, product structure tree as well as the bill of materials. If we were to select on the system assembly document, it would pull up the Excel file inside of our configuration management library. This document as well has the same title block, and it goes through the process of building uh, Paul. This shows the very top level of assembling those nine sub-assemblies together to create Paul. This is one example inside showing the ARM1 counterclockwise sub-assembly as is mounted onto our Kevlar Nomex honeycomb platform using four bolts and four washers which screw into our two mount blocks. Later in the document is an electronic schematic showing the very top level electrical connections. Note this is not every electrical connection inside of the hall, but just the top level connecting the sub-assemblies together. Each sub-assembly is denoted by the dotted lines here, and all the components outside are individual parts that are not uh, inside of a sub-assembly below it. This is the system bill of materials. It is quite large, as you can see, with multiple sub-assemblies inside of it, as well as the uh, individual parts to put them together. Each part has its corresponding part number, which is hyperlinked to its individual document, as well as the description. At the top, it shows all the flavors, if there are flavors for each of the documents, and down below show the quantity of each one of those components in its flavor. If we were to select on the Spock box subassembly, the 200 level bill of material, excuse me, payload bay subassembly, it shows that there are two subassemblies within this subassembly, as well as the hardware required to put it together. The 300 level document of this, the sub assembly assembly document, shows the two sub assemblies, the bay and the door, as it's put together with the corresponding hardware components. This is an example of a part drawing. This is the tube mount bracket. This is the same document that was provided to our machinist, Mr. Patrick David, to create the component in our machine shop here at Every Riddle. Of note is our tolerance block that we used. This is the general tolerance that we use at our machine shop here to create all of our components. In conclusion, Paul had a four-level product structure tree that had 22 unique sub-assemblies with multiples of a couple of them, totaling 28 sub-assemblies. There are 93 unique parts with 22 flavors, accumulating a total of 1,055 individual parts. The current document status is that all documents have been completed. All documents have been submitted into our configuration management library. We also have physical copies that are provided over here in two of the binders. I'll now pass it off to Christina Halverson, who will conclude with management. Thank you, Benjamin. As you stated, my name is Christina Halverson, and I will conclude with management of this project. Here's an overview of our project budget. We were awarded $3,811. This funding stems from the College of Engineering, Ignite Funding, as well as other donations. Um, upon the completion of this project, we have spent approximately $2,955, with a remainder of approximately $855 and a margin of $860. This difference is because the propulsion subsystem spent over there a lot of budget. Here's our labor budget in terms of cost and hours. Students may log uh, hours in one of five categories. Those categories are management, engineering, professional development, administration, and technical. The total amount of hours spent on this project from last semester and this semester total 5,421 hours. 
Here's our milestone schedule. To date, we have completed all milestones except for the system validation review, which we're currently in progress of. Towards the middle of the semester, we started to fall behind the uh, due dates for some of the milestones. And these are indicated by the positive differences between the due dates and the date completed. However, by system testing, we were all caught up, and we actually performed our system testing four days earlier than the due date, and we are currently on track to finish on time. Here's an example of one of the lessons we learned this semester. <laughs> <laughs> on the left is our uh, system fabric, or, excuse me, our prototype fabrication test, um, where we were just showing a general proof of concept that yes, we can make everything work. Um, what we learned is that we need to anchor our system when we are testing, and for all future tests, we did anchor the system. testing is safety. Um, you can never be too careful, you can never be too cautious, it is better to be safe than sorry. Additionally, we have learned this semester that communication is key, that if one subsystem makes a change, this will affect all other subsystems, and it is necessary to communicate this idea so that the, sub the whole system can move forward as a whole. And finally, we learned that requirements shall be your Bible. If it's not a requirement, don't put it in, it's not necessary. Paragalacticon would like to thank Drs. Beck and Benavides for their continued support and guidance in this project, as well as all other faculty, staff, donors, supporters to this project. This concludes our presentation, but before I invite my team to join me on stage, I would like to invite the SPOC team to come up and give you a demonstration of the payload deployment.
Thank you, Christina. So basically, uh, what we would like to convey is that we are essentially not passing this requirement, and there are several several things we could do to improve how we are attaching the APM to the actual system itself. So you're telling me that the data does not support meeting your requirement? Yes. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot of noise in there. What, what type of sensor is, is providing this data? Can you guys answer that? Like physically, what kind uh, of sensor is it? It's an accelerometer. What type of accelerometer? I would like to defer this question to you, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the APM, there is an MPU 6000 that has a gyroscope and accelerometer that is built in. And that is what, that is the accelerometer that is used to that is representing this data. Okay, so are you getting, what kind of data are you getting off the APM? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the raw data. I would like to pass that back over to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's good. <laughs> so I believe it's the acceleration. So is that you use? Okay, but you keep using the word raw to describe the data over and over again. Are you sure it's raw data? Is it is it coming to you as a voltage, as a you know? So where I'm going with the question is, you need to understand the hardware and the assumptions and the limitations of the sensors you're using. So raw data is great and it's a good thing to report, but presenting raw data to me, especially in terms of requirement, is not so great. Uh, there's noise in it. I need to know what of this this blue data up here is noise and what I can believe. Because if you, if you have noise that's going out to, in this case, I don't know, a 
thousand percent of your requirement. That looks really bad, but in reality, that may be a single point out there. So you guys, later on, you alluded to filtering. Uh, what kind of filtering do you guys want to do? Did you guys get, look into that? Do you do any research on what kind of filtering would be best to apply to this? Um, we, due to time constraints, we did not do any extensive research. However, off the top of our heads, we could go off with a low-pass filtering due to that high noise values. Okay. Uh, I would say that low-pass filtering is not a filter that you want to use for that. But, but that's a whole world. You know, it, I realize you guys didn't have time to look into that, but just, just know, be prepared for questions like that. So. You guys did a good job. Um, otherwise, one more thing I want to know. Oh, so when you guys did your free fall test, um, you basically just did the, the structural part of, of it. Why? Alex, and the structure seeming. Uh, there are a couple reasons why we only drop the structure as opposed to the whole system. The first of which being that the it was part of the requirement that it states that the structure subsystem shall withstand a free fall of one meter. It doesn't allude to the system as a whole, which is the first reason. But um, the main reason we didn't add in all the other components to that is that we didn't know how those components would um, react to an impact because there was not any structural analysis done on those individual components to begin with. So in order for a want of the team to figure out the safety of those components, we decided to just go with the structure for the time being. If we had the time, we um, had mentioned in the presentation we wanted to, to create another uh, prototype so that we could, in fact, add weights to compensate for the uh, addition of the other components and test the system as a whole instead. Okay, weight's part of it, but inertia and stiffness also a huge impact. So, all right, thanks guys. Have you been doing weights at this level? That was one of my questions as well. Uh, as in adding weights? Yeah, just putting weights on top of your structure when you did your drop test to try to simulate some of the additional components. Part of it was being unable to simulate exactly how it would perform as um, like using, using weights in those specific locations. It wouldn't necessarily let me restart the answer to that question. I don't know where I was going with that. Um, <laughs> mainly time constraints. <laughs> safely other than just duct tape. Uh, I would, it, it is a good reason. It is a uh, it's industry representative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Coming from you now, now I really want to go back and do it. So with how many batteries you guys have on your system, did you consider doing um, redundancy going to two different ones and kind of building in the capability in case you lose one of your batteries? I would like to pass that to uh, we did at one point consider uh, cross tying the batteries into a single power bus and then feeding the power unit from that into the battery into the PSCs. Um, we did, however, consult with a uh, professor on campus, Dr. Davis, and he uh, expressed his, his uh, uh, concern that that would actually uh, result in more of a failure. Um, the APM is programmed to have multiple fail safes so that if one of the one or two of the motors fail, or say one of the batteries fails and can't power the motor, mm -hmm. that it will try its best in less technical terms, I guess, to recover and land safely. But in terms of uh, feeding uh, the battery to, uh, say, a power bus, one to two, two separate motors, we did uh, we, we shied away from that. Uh, we're kind of afraid that it would fail and would result in. <laughs> okay, um, my other comment was just kind of a bit picky one. If you want to go to 
slide uh, 18. So um, in these tables, it would have been that, uh, beneficial to see you know, your average in the table as well so that they know more you can even be different. Um, and then also on slide 37, uh, you have your experimentally derived totals, but your, you, you claim that you've experimentally and numerically validated and although it's, it's kind of insignificant because these are your, well, it's not insignificant, you should put your um, analytically, your analytical tools in there as well. Okay. Those are the only two little things that I had. Um, other than that, you guys did a great job. This is really impressive for your two semesters. And it's awesome to see that it flew. And congratulations to all. Thank you. I just want to say a great job. Uh, just because I'm a former astronaut and I still have to take jazz theaters every once in a while. This is a perfect example that you can, in fact, build an aircraft using metric. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Eros, that's not going away. Right. Uh, most of my questions are mostly fairly nitpicky. Uh, just kind of design differences I'm noticing between the PDR last semester and what's here now. Uh, uh, the first one was, you mentioned uh, design just before you mentioned the beginning of this presentation that you were going to use uh, EDS for propulsion. And I'm noticing a lack of ducts. <laughs> yes. Um, at the beginning of the semester, we reevaluated. Um, we realized that there would probably be an induced um, yaw on the system because we did not have counter rotating EDFs on our opposing sides. Um, we had looked into counter rotating EDFs, however, because of cost constraints. Um, and shipping constraints as well as product availability, we were not able to purchase those. Um, the propellers were, I guess, easier in terms of the APM being able to operate them more easily and they would still provide the amount of thrust that we needed. Okay. Um, the next one was, uh, last semester, you proposed a quadcopter and I noticed there were two more engines. I, I'm just saying I know the answer to this one ahead of time, but I'm just curious to see how you can answer that one. Okay, <laughs> yes. Um, the electric ducted fans, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, propulsion, um, they were producing more lift than our propellers currently, and so we decided to add in two more propellers, um, also because we wanted counter-rotating and we wanted even spacing around the platform, we decided to go with them. Symmetric design, go with six. Okay. Um, the next one is on the NPQ one for the structures team. Uh, originally, you had the legs designed to be fully supported by the body of the aircraft. Uh, I noticed that you are now moving supports off to the propulsion system. I was wondering why that was designed to change. Alex Noyes? The main reason the legs are now farther out from underneath the platform uh, is to make room for the payload. Because if they were any closer, the door wouldn't be able to deploy without interfering with the legs of being caught, for that reason. Um, as well as to uh, distribute where those forces are being, um, well, distributed. Okay. Um, the, uh, the power subsystem. You mentioned for testing purposes that you did switch to a larger cell battery, and went from two to three, and I was just wondering if that had any impact on, say, the weight measurements or any other performance that was not necessarily counting the fact that you just swap the batteries. Uh, Adrian Rector. The weight, measurement, the weight measurement was done previous to the battery switch, and the previous two cell battery was sufficient to complete the entire mission. Okay. Um, and the last one was, I was just reading of your lessons learned, and I just want a little more detail on that. Uh, you just state very bluntly Germanic words. Yes. <laughs> um, that came from Dr. Beck at the beginning of last semester. <laughs> we used a lot of non-technical language. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very nice job. I used to have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, Respect to the propulsion, when you did the calibration, how did you do the calibration to measure your propulsion thrust? Well, I'm going to have to, and that's Brown. Thank you. 
So we did the calibration using um, known masses attached to a mass hanger that was attached to the motor board. And using that, we were able to derive both, um, to derive a modulus of elasticity for the test stand. And then comparing that test stand to the uh, modulus of elasticity um, that was published for those materials used, the 36 steel and the aluminum 6061, um, we found that we had approximately 14% difference and um, a 10% difference. <coughs> See, my other comment was along the lines of the other one. It it's, uh, would have been much better, I think, to have found some way to strap mass onto the structure when you did the drop test. However, you did that, it's important to do a drop test, obviously, with the actual mass that they could apply. But what you proved was that the structure can withstand a drop in itself. Um, so, you know, that's something that. You really need to strive again in your testing to make sure that you're representing actual flight uh, condition. Let's see, the configuration management presentation was astounding. I echo the comment from down. I have seen numerous contractor presentations that don't have anywhere near as good a configuration management system as what you guys just demonstrated. That was, you're hired.